Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Come on, can we give the Lord a good hand clap of praise this morning? Aren't you thankful to be in the house of God today? There's no place I'd rather be. I could be in the finest hospital. I could be in the nicest nursing home, nicest funeral home, but I'd much rather be in the house of God, in the presence of the Almighty King. Come on, one more time. Let's lift up a praise to him this morning. The Bible tells us in Psalms 100, uh, verse 4, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Aren't you thankful we serve a God that's never changing? Doesn't matter what situation we're facing, whether we're on the mountaintop or in the valley low, Jesus is still the same. I'm excited to be in the house of God today. Let's give all of our visitors a warm welcome today at Gospel Tabernacle. Thank you for coming and visiting with us today, as well as our home uh, congregation. Thank you to all for coming and expecting something great in the house of the Lord today. You know, I feel as in the house of God is where we find refuge. The house of God is where I run to shelter. The house of God is where I find what I need to get me through this world. Uh, today we're going to begin with prayer. I'm excited. I, I, just feel a, I just feel a stirring in my spirit today. And I hope there is two or three with the same feeling. The Bible tells us where there are two or three gathered in his name there he is in the midst as well if we can get in his presence if we can get unified this morning there is nothing that God cannot do but let's uplift a few people in prayer this morning uh, I'm glad to see sister Nelda Sellers uh, in service with us this morning let's keep uplifting sister Helen uh, she is still needing a touch from God expecting the Lord to restore and to give her strength uh, Brother Ricky Butler, let's keep uplifting him. Uh, Brother Fred Dillman, Jackie Jernigan, uh, Brother Bishop, uh, keep remembering him and his family. Uh, Kirk Thurman and Thomas Western, both of these are dealing with cancer. Uh, Karen, Karen Lloyd, uh, Cliff Lloyd, also we need to keep in remembrance today, Brother Haitley's sister-in-law. Um, also, let's, let's uplift Brother Haitley today. I've, been, I've had him on my mind the past couple days. I know he's taken on a new journey. Uh, he's embraced a new avenue in his life, and we want what's best for him. I love Brother Haitley dearly. Uh, he, is, he has been an impact on my life as several, many of us here today. Uh, ben Ivey's dad is still needing a touch from God. Uh, Julie Morris dealing with cancer. Uh, brother and sister Cut Shaw both need a touch from God today. Uh, also, Brother Caden Cooper's cousin, Maddie B., we've been uplifting her in prayer. Uh, he gave me a little bit of an update this morning. Uh, they tried to get her on just a CPAP uh, machine the past couple days. Didn't work as planned. She is back on the vent. Is that correct, Brother? So we really need to uplift that family. Um, if any of you know medical-wise that the vent is never a good thing. It's never a good thing good situation so God needs to intervene we need the Lord to intervene for that family if it was you in their shoes you would be calling out to God you would be begging and pleading so as a church today the people that are around us we hurt for them the people that are in battles we go to war for them if you have a need today, let it be known by the lifting of your hand. And today, as a unified body of God, we are going to battle for one another. God, we come before you this morning. Lord, you see every need that's been spoken. Lord, you see every intent of every heart. God, you see every situation. God, that may have us bound and afflicted today, whether it be sickness, whether it be disease, whatever illness it may be, God, I'm praying that as one for another today, we would be a unified body of God. Lord, if there is more power as we come in unity together, Lord, we're binding upon that name of Jesus. God, the Bible teaches there is power in that name, all power in heaven and earth. God, I speak the name of Jesus over this service. I speak the name of Jesus over these situations. God, we have entered into the presence of the Almighty King where shackles can fall, where 
our chains can be loose. Lord, we are expecting the supernatural today. Let us bind together, faith believe it, to move that mountain today. God, we give you all the praise and glory. Come on, if you believe that God can still work wonders, signs and miracles, come on, let's make him feel welcomed in this house today. Oh, Lord, come and dwell with your people in this sanctuary. God, come and meet with your people this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, can we take just a second? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm feeling sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Come on, let's welcome in here. This is not just an ordinary Sunday morning service. Lord, but we are experiencing something moving right now. God, I speak peace over this congregation. Lord, I speak faith over this congregation as a body of God. Lord, there are people that are afflicted this morning, but we've come into the place of freedom. We've stepped into the presence of deliverance. We've stepped into the a place of deliverance on this Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Church, it's time that we quit putting limits on God. It's time that we quit limiting God and we just release Him. Let's release Him in this house this morning. Let's give Him a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. The ushers can be making their way this morning. We're going to go in our tithes and our offerings today. I do have a, a few announcements real briefly. Uh, this coming Wednesday is our annual tomato and bologna sandwich uh, meal. Uh, service is going to start at 6.30. Uh, we're going to do the food and fellowship and uh, following. Let's be in prayer. Uh, count one is quickly approaching July the 19th through the 22nd. Uh, that Wednesday night of youth count, which is July the 20th, uh, the doors will be open to everybody that wants to come and have prayer that night from 6.30 to 7.30. Um, if you are interested in going to camp, being in service with all of us that Wednesday night, uh, please get with Sister Barbie for more information on that. She's going to be carrying the van, taking a group of people. Also, if you are a staff member of youth camp this year, directly after service, we are having a meeting in the fellowship hall with Pastor. Um, also... Uh, the week after youth camp, which is July the 27th through the 29th, that's a Wednesday through Friday, we are doing VBS. Uh, we need all volunteers. We need all hands on deck. If you've ever been involved in anything to do with VBS, you know it's stressful, it's time consuming, and we need all the help we can get. So if you're a Sunday school teacher or if you want to volunteer, uh, we're having a meeting directly after service today as well. Uh, just keep in mind, Tuesday night prayers are open at 6.30 and Saturday night prayer at 6.30. How many knows that's how we're going to the next level is in prayer. At this time, let's give back to the Lord as he's given to us. Men of music, if you will.
dismiss. Lord, we thank you. Thank you to all for giving this morning. Uh, God will bless you greatly. You can't outgive God today. Um, our worship team is getting ready to lead us in worship today. I want to share just real briefly. Uh, yesterday, I was up in Dixon, Tennessee. I had the opportunity to uh, ride in a Tesla. How many knows what a Tesla is? Everybody heard about a Tesla? Well, I had heard all the jazz and all the, the hype about it, so me and my wife, we was able to go and ride with someone. No, we didn't buy a Tesla. No, we was not thinking about it, but uh, we know some friends that had one, so we get in it. He takes us down the road. Have in mind, we're in Dixon, Tennessee. I don't know anything about the back roads. I don't know anything about the location. It's an unknown territory for me. We get out in the middle of the road. He's like, come and drive. I'm like, oh boy. I get over there in that Tesla. We get to going and we're driving. He hits a button. He said, take your hands off the steering wheel. I'm like, what would you just say? He said, take your hands off the steering wheel. And this car begins to drive itself. I'm talking every curve. I'm talking about every crevice. Dodged every part in the road that it could dodge. You know what I had to do in that moment? I had to step out on faith. I ain't going to lie. I put faith in something that man created yesterday. And there was a time we was coming upon a curve. Come on, I'm getting somewhere this morning. And I was thinking, Lord, somebody better take this wheel. That thing began to take that sharp curve and all of a sudden cut us back. But guys... That was technology. That was man-made. And I was willing to put my life in danger and to have enough faith in that. They call that autopilot. That was a car being my pilot. Today we know the creator of all things. Today we know the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. But we're so iffy at times even when we know who he is to be our pilot. Every road that you go down, you need to say, God, I give you everything. I give you every obstacle. God, I'm taking my hands off the steering wheel. And let's just say this morning, Jesus, take the wheel. Let's put faith into God and see what he'll do. Let's worship with the worship team.
Come on, church. I feel it in my spirit today. Today is the day of breakthroughs. Today is the day of victory. There is nothing too hard for my God. There is nothing impossible for my God. If you want to know the real reason why God's not moving for you, step out on faith today. He is waiting for you to make the next move. He's waiting on you to receive what you need this morning. Come on, if you need anything, if you need to overcome any adversary, if you need deliverance, if you need restoration, if you need God to perform, give it to the Lord.
He's great and he's greatly to be praised. What a sweet stirring of the Holy Ghost is here today. As deep calleth unto deep. The call of God is going forth here today. I feel God calling some young people to some ministries. I feel God stirring a young man's heart today. Oh, yes. Can we just lift our hands here for a moment and bathe in his presence? Let's lift our voices just for a minute. God, we want you to have your way here today. Move us out of the way. Let your will be done. Let your will be done. Let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we give him a hand clap of praise and glorify his name? As we're being seated this morning in the presence of the Lord. So thankful, so thankful that we serve a God who meets us in the middle of our circumstance. Meets us in the middle of our impossibility. He's a God that meets us. Said, if you'll draw nigh unto me, I'll draw nigh unto you. I want to tell somebody today that God is still calling people. You hear me today? God is still calling people. Notice I didn't say perfect people. He's still calling flawed, messed up individuals that have long rap sheets, that have big pasts, but he's still calling people. And we ought to thank God for that right now. If we had to be perfect to be called, how could any of us stand before the presence of the Lord? Hear me, young person. Keep seeking after the face of God. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Those who hunger and thirst for being used by God, God will use. He will not turn you away. He will use you. I want to preach to us just for a little bit. I, I didn't really know if I wanted to preach today, but... I feel God has gave me confirmation as I was praying here earlier. Told me there's some people here that need to hear this word. And I want God to speak to us today. I'm going to read some verses for us. A little bit more than I normally do. I'm going to be reading out of the book of Mark chapter 4 and also the book of Jonah chapter 1. Are you in a hurry today? Well, I'm not in a hurry if you are. Uh, because I want God to do His will today. I want Him to do His will. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and just say this before I begin. Thank you for all who has given uh, towards our Ukraine missions. I believe by the time we've got pledges and all that uh, installed, I'm going to get a final count here in the next week. But I believe we're close to $12,000 and our goal was $10,000. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to continue to give to missions. I believe that's going to be a great blessing to our church. And also, we are going to uh, not do not only international missions, but uh, missions here close to us. We want to help people and help our community. So thank you for giving uh, to that. Mark chapter 4, verse 35, and says, And the same day when the even was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. When he had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Book of Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah 
the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. There was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and he was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be God, that God will think upon us that we perish not. I want to preach this morning, Awaken by the perishing. Awaken by the perishing. Will you lift your hands all across this house? Father, we've already felt such a move of the Holy Ghost, such a stirring in this house. I pray you'd confirm your word to your people right now, oh God. As you speak in this house, I pray there would go no ear that would not hear your voice speak in their direction. Move upon every soul, every man, every woman, every boy and every girl. God, convict us today. Draw us close to you, Lord. Let us experience your love, your mercy, your grace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Don't worry, I'm taking off my jacket because I'm a little warm. Uh, I don't know if I, how much I'll go today. I, I believe I've come to wake somebody up in this house this morning. We find in the two different, very different stories that I read, and they were both in very different times uh, over uh, history, if you will. But as different as these stories are, they bear so much similarity. We find that we have two sets of people. One of these people are the disciples and they're on a boat with Jesus and a mighty storm is raised up when they're on that boat. And then we find the story of Jonah as he is on a boat with strangers that he does not know and still there is a mighty tempest and a great wind in that story as well. So we find two different individuals, but they have a similarity. They both found out how to sleep in the midst of a storm. I want to pose a question today. How can a man sleep in a boat with violent waves crashing, mighty winds blowing, and terrified sea men crying. It seems so far-fetched to me how anybody could sleep in such circumstances. I don't believe they had any Benadryl or uh, any Xanax back in that day that these men had popped and said, we're going to sleep through anything. I don't believe they had anything like that. And so I bear the question today, what could make a man have so much peace, if you will, that they could sleep in the midst of a storm? Now I understand if you're sleeping in your bed, it's comfortable, king-size California bed at house, and the rain's coming down, and the wind's coming through, and I can sleep through that. But to be on a boat where the waves are rocking you side to side. And I don't know what kind of pillow they had, but I doubt it was a my pillow. I bet it wasn't comfortable at all, but still these men were fast asleep. But how? The waves are beating against the ship. It, the ship was almost broken. And if that wasn't enough, these Men were on boats with experienced seamen. And if the seamen are scared, you and I better be scared. 
because they've been through some storms. They've been through some uncertainties. They've seen some big waves. They've experienced some huge storms. But the Bible says that these disciples, which were fishermen by nature and, and had been out on the sea and had weathered the storms, they came to Jesus and said, Do you not care that we are about to die? Do you not care that we're about to perish? These men that had to have seen great and mighty things, but yet Jesus was asleep on the pillow. Well, I can vouch for Jesus. The reason that he was asleep, the Bible says, he's the prince of peace. My Lord, all he had to do was close his eyes and he was covered in peace. It was nothing for him to close his eyes and even in the midst of a storm to be relaxed and at comfort. But I don't believe that was the only reason that Jesus was asleep. But Jesus knew the future. And Jesus knew that he had already told those disciples that we are going to the other side. So the waves are coming in. The waters are rising up. I can see Peter with his bucket in hand throwing as much water as he can over the shore. And they were all working together, every one of them. And they looked back there. They didn't see Jesus with a bucket in his hand. Better yet, they didn't even see Jesus with his eyes open. But he had a pillow. It was probably wet. I don't know. But he was fast asleep in the back of the boat. Jesus was testing the disciples and their faith. And I will tell you that they failed. But I would have failed too if I was on a ship that was going down. And Jesus was on the boat with me. Why in the world would I not wake him up? The God that's all powerful and almighty. That can do exceeding and abundantly and above all. That we ask or think. Come on, somebody needs to be reminded today that if you got Jesus on your boat, you got everything that you need. You don't need a bucket. Come on, somebody. You, you, you don't need a program. You got Jesus on your boat. He was fast asleep, and so I can say, okay, I can understand how a man, which was not just an ordinary man, but the Bible says that he was God and he was manifest in the flesh, but he still had flesh on him. But I can understand how he was sleeping but then we skip to the story of Jonah, which is quite a different story. He was not God manifest in the flesh by any means. Read the short book of Jonah. I believe it's four or five chapters. You'll find out that he was not, he didn't have a lot of attributes that Jesus had. He was quite a different story. The Bible says that he was in the middle of fleeing from the presence of the Lord. God had spoke to him and said, Jonah, Go to that great city Nineveh and preach and to cry against it. But the Bible says that Jonah fled and he went down to Joppa and he hopped on a ship and he started heading out away from the presence of the Lord. He wasn't just fleeing from God, folks. He was fleeing from peace. He was fleeing from joy. He, he was fleeing from the plan of God. But still, the Bible says when a great tempest came in that sea, and that wind started to blow that ship that him and those mariners were on that Jonah was found in the side of the ship and he was fast asleep he wasn't just barely asleep he was fast asleep how can an ordinary man like you and I be sitting in the bottom of a ship when all hell is breaking loose on the surface and still he keeps his eyes shut through it all. It took the shipmaster coming down to him and saying, Jonah, get up. Jonah, open your eyes. Do you not know what's happening? Listen, we barely have anything left on this boat. We threw away all of our product. We threw away all of our money. We have nothing left. And we look and say, where in the world is Jonah? And we come down here and looky here. You're fast asleep on a ship. Can I tell somebody today that the worst position that you and I, who are the called of God, can be in is asleep and fast asleep at that in the midst of hell and turmoil that this world is facing today. God forbid that a sinner walk in the door and find the church fast asleep. 
God forbid somebody's in their worst turmoil. They're going through their worst marital problems. They're going through the worst of the worst. And they walk into the church and somebody pats them on the back and say, what do you want me to do about it? When they come to you, they're coming for an answer. The waves did not move Jonah. It may have moved his body, but it didn't move him enough to wake him up. The sea didn't shake him. He was unmoved and he was fast asleep. I come to preach to somebody today and encourage you in the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you that one of the worst places we can be in is a state where nothing moves us. In a state where nothing we go through moves us. Hey, I come to talk to somebody. We are not called to be fast asleep in this generation. But the Bible tells us to be sober and to be vigilant and to watch for the day of judgment draweth nigh. So what was even crazier about this is when he woke him up, Brother Tanner, Jonah didn't act like it was a big deal. Well, Jonah, what what do we need to do? Well, just throw me overboard. You mean to tell you what Jonah's problem was? He didn't care if he lived or died. He didn't care if he lived or died, so he didn't. He definitely didn't care about the folks that was on the ship with him. He didn't care if they lived or died. He said, look, if you want to be saved, just throw me overboard. I, this is my opinion, but I don't think Jonah had any idea that there was a whale waiting on him. I think he was expected just to get thrown off that boat and just to seek deep and dark into that sea. Why? He was through a life. He was depressed. He was at his wit's end. He he, he didn't care. Sure, he had a relationship with God, but he was at a point in his life where he said, I'll sleep through it all. I'm depressed. I'll take whatever I got to take to get through this next day. I don't care if I take another breath. I'm willing to perish. God, will you just take me? Will you just kill me? I don't want anything to do with the things of God. They didn't want to throw him in. I believe that they cared more about his life than he did because the Bible says that they tried as hard as they could to get that boat to the land, but God made it where that boat wasn't going to move. And so they didn't have a choice. They, They had to throw him in. And when they threw him in, the winds and the rain, it all ceased. But there was waiting on him a great fish that was going to swallow him up. The book of Jonah tells us in chapter 2 that Jonah prayed to God out of the fish's belly. Listen to what he said. He said, I've cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I. And thou heardest my voice. You may tell you what God had to do with Jonah. He had to give him a glimpse of hell to wake him up to see where he was living at. He got so caught up in just living for God and understanding that that, that, that he had a job to do and he didn't even want to do that. But God was so merciful to Jonah that he said, I'm going to have a great fish that's going to swallow you up and you're going to have to stay in his belly three whole days. Days, Can you imagine that fish's belly? How much it stunk, all that acid that was in there. How dark it was, the groanings of his stomach. You think you're going through a hard time. Try to be in a fish's belly for three days in the bottom of the ocean. That's why Jonah said, this feels a lot like hell to me. This, this feels a lot like hell. But if I could talk to Jonah, I'd tell him today, that's nothing even close. That's nothing even close. That may have been a representation of what people's going to go through, but that's not even close. He went from the presence of God. He was still asleep. Let me tell you this. Jonah's eyes may not have been closed, but when they threw him in that water, Brother Tanner, he was still asleep. 
He was still asleep. He, he didn't wake up until he cried unto God in that fish's belly. And he said, if you, if you want me to preach, I'll go preach. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Let me tell somebody, we should not have to feel the flames of hell before we realize that we got a plan and we got a purpose in God. We shouldn't have to go through a hard time to understand that if God be for us, who can be against us? We should not have to, to go through uncertainty and trials to live for God. You've got to understand today that the best life that you and I can ever live is one lived for God. And so in that belly of hell, Jonah cried unto the Lord and God heard him. He refocused. He got repurposed. But sometimes even three days of hell can't change a man's attitude. I'm going to tell you this. I feel this right now. There's going to be some people that are burning in hell and still are going to curse God to the top of their breath because even hell ain't going to make them change their mind. But I don't want that to be you and I. I want to make up my mind today. I've got to make it to the throne of God. i got to make it to see Jesus. i got a heaven to gain. And then the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. I want to tell somebody today, God should not have to beg you and I to tell somebody about him. Oh, God shouldn't have to beg you and I and torment you and I to get us to tell somebody about the goodness of God. But it took Jonah three days in the belly of a whale, three days in the belly of hell. And he finally got up. He said, I'll go preach to him. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And he said, look, Nineveh was a great city. It was three days journey. And the Bible says Jonah entered into the city a day's journey. That don't mean that he went the length of the city in one day. It means the city was three days worth of travel, but he walked one day into it. He wasn't quite to the center or he was real close to the center. But then he decided to open up his voice. You know what he told him? Bible said he didn't preach a profound message. Didn't say he preached a, a sermon on a mount. You know what it said he said? He just told him and said in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overthrown. You're telling me sometimes all it takes is to tell somebody that God's going to bring judgment on them if they don't change their ways? That's what I'm telling you, folks. Because look what happened after that. So the people of Nineveh believed God, how can they believe in him who they have not heard? Come on, somebody. God has ordained by the foolishness of preaching for us to reach this world. But can I tell you, you do not have to be ordained in, in an organization to be a preacher of the gospel. You just got to open up your mouth and say, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about a God who saved me. Let me tell you about somebody who can save your soul. They believe God. They proclaimed a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. This entire city, this entire city, every single one of them said, we're going to believe God. We're going to turn from our wicked ways. We're going to be who he's called us to be. But look what happened in the book of Jonah chapter 4. You would think that Jonah would be having a celebration. You would think he'd be jumping around and saying, God, thank you so much for saving these people's souls. But you know what he said? It said, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord. I want somebody to hear this. Was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? 
I believe I've heard in times past that maybe Jonah jumped on that boat because that city was big and evil and the people would maybe cut his head off or, or kick him out of the city. But I, I got scripture that he did. That ain't the reason he didn't go. He said, you know why I jumped on that boat and headed to Tarshish? Let me read it to you here. He said, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. You know why Jonah jumped on that boat? He didn't get on there because he was afraid that God would not save him. He got on that boat because he was afraid that God would save him. God forbid we get a spirit of Pharisee on us uh, when we start to sit in our high places, uh, in our upper rooms, uh, when we got people that are lost uh, and are dying on the street corner, but yet we say, God, they don't deserve it. God, they don't need it. God, your mercy isn't for them. I'm headed to Tarshish. I didn't come to badmouth Jonah, but on one side I did because Jonah, you lost it, brother. Jonah, you forgot the reason God saved you. He didn't save you just to save your soul, but he saved you so you could shine your light into the city of Nineveh so that men and women would be saved. I don't know if uh, he had had some run-ins with the people of Nineveh before. I don't know if he had some enemies down there. But I let me tell somebody, if somebody has done something to hurt you, uh, that should not mean uh, that you turn your back to them. Uh, pray the judgment of God on them uh, and say, God, I don't care if you save them or not. Uh, every one of them, every enemy, every foe, uh, we should look to God and say, please save them. They need your salvation. They need your mercy. I've come to an understanding that sometimes we let circumstance keep us from really doing God's will. You know what God Jesus told the disciples? He said, when you go into a place and they don't receive you, don't worry about it. Just shake off your feet, turn around, and go somewhere else. But never, he told them, you better never preach to them. You better never open your mouth to them. He just said, you preach it. If they don't believe it, that's on them. But you got a job to open up your mouth in this generation. I come to tell you, if the church keeps its mouth shut, Hollywood will take our place. If the church keeps their mouth shut, the government will take our place. It's time for the church to open up their mouth and say we got a God who is able to save that which is lost. Come on, it's not time to get quiet. It's not time to close the door and say door knocking is of yesterday. Going out on the street corner is of yesterday. We need somebody that's willing to step outside their house, get the trumpet and say if nobody else will blow it, I'll blow it. I want to be a beacon of hope for our community. The Bible tells us that there was a man who was sent from heaven and his name was John. John was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. Sure, John lived in a wilderness. He wore crazy clothes. He ate crazy food. But one thing you can't ever say about John is that he was scared to preach Jesus because he was crying out in that wilderness, repent, prepare ye the way of the Lord. There's coming one after me that's greater than I I can't even latch his sandals he's greater than I come on we can't get away from preaching Jesus we can't get so infatuated with ourselves that we forget unless Jesus lived unless he died unless he resurrected we could not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost let's get back to preaching Jesus let's get back to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ 
The Bible says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You ain't got to do nothing but tell them what Jesus done. That's all you got to do. He did enough. He shed his blood. He died on the rugged cross. We just got to go and open up our mouth. You know what Jesus said about John? He had high praise for him. He said, there's not been ever, ever a woman that's been born to a man that's greater than John the Baptist. He may have smelt weird. He may have done stuff weird. But you know what he done? He prepared a way for me to come in and baptize the nation with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You know, that's our job, Brother Chris. We just got to prepare the way for the Lord. We just got to tell them, and God is going to come in. We just got to get them to believe, and then Jesus will come in. You ain't got to do their chin like this for them to receive the Spirit of God. That's on the verge of blasphemy. But I tell you this, you tell them about Jesus. You tell them about the message. And when the Spirit of God, when it gets the utterance, it'll fall on them. They probably won't have me at any conferences. We try so hard sometimes to do it our way. Forcing it. God, if he's going to have his way, as Brother Tanner said, we got to take our hands off the wheel, Brother Ben, and say, God, have your way. Have your way. Let your will be done. And the moment that we do that, then God can come in and he can fill people with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But we got to tell them. We got to tell them about Jesus. There's no greater name than that of Jesus Christ. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not by works, lest any man boast. Not by dress, but by the Spirit of God are we saved. We've got to have His Spirit. We've got to have Jesus living inside of us. Can I take my time today? If you got to go, I understand. If you got a lunch to get to, I understand. Let me tell you something about the Spirit of God. The Bible says that God created all things. The light created all things. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. When we receive the Spirit of God, Brother Tanner, that is a flame of fire that is in us. That is a light. We, 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 Jesus isn't over here in a light and, and we're just going towards him. But when we get his spirit, we got a light inside of us. Why do you think scripture says, ye are children of the light? It also says, light, let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. <coughs> we don't show the light for them to come in and glorify me or you. It ain't about us. They ain't coming in to glorify you for how good you dress, how good you talk. But we're supposed to let our light shine. That way they look at, can look at us and say, God had to do that for him. Jesus had to do that for them. I see the light all over them. That light, be ye children of the light. He said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. We do not go to high places so we can be seen of ourselves. But we go to high places. That way people can know where to go when the times get tough. And they know when they get in those walls. It's not because man's hands built them. But it's because God built the city. And he built the church. We are bringing glory to his name. Thank God for John the Baptist. 
Thank God. John the Baptist, he, he baptized men to repentance. He dunked them in the water. He prepared them. Can I tell you this? If you'll get dunked in the water, if you'll repent of your sins, if you'll get right with God, just tarry a little bit. The Holy Ghost will come. That power will come. Don't stop at repentance. The disciples didn't. They had to seek for the promise of God. Come on, somebody. All right, let me get back to where I was preaching. Pig trail there. No, I'm not going to blame that on a pig trail. You wonder why Jonah was fast asleep in that boat. Let me tell you why. <laughs> Listen to what the Bible says. I just gave that back to you, Brother Chris. That's what the Bible said. God said there was more than 120,000 people in the city of Nineveh. Can I tell you if 120,000 screaming voices from hell isn't enough to wake a man up, a storm sure won't. If you were the image of your family member burning in flames of hell, Ain't enough to wake you from your sleeping slumber. Ain't nothing going to wake you up. Ha! We got to see it, Chris. We got to see that uh, poor man as, as he was on the other side in heaven. And that rich man was sitting there and said, just put a little water on my tongue. I, I just need a drop. And he said, look, will you go tell my brothers I waited too long. But there was no cry for his brothers. Why? Because his voice was dead and gone. I come to encourage somebody. It's time you get a hold on your future. It's time you understand that unless you get saved, you're going to die and go to a devil's hell. But you got an opportunity today. The gift of God is here this morning. And he wants to fill you with salvation. Nothing can move Jonah. Nothing can move him. He didn't understand what well, seven and eight words is all it took to save 120,000 folks. If I could just say five words to everybody in this building to save your soul, I wish God would give them to me. But God forbid, I lay down and say, I'm going to sleep through it. I'm going to sleep to the resurrection. I'm going to sleep. I know it's not popular. I don't preach a lot of popular stuff, but I come to stir the church. I come to let you understand that there's people dying and going to hell every single day. But God said, if you'll just open up your mouth, I can save them. I can save them. If you'll just open up your mouth, you're not going to get all of them. But there's going to be some that believe. There's going to be some that call on my name. There's going to be some that come to repentance. But if you stay asleep in the sides of the ship, none can be saved. My Lord... He probably cared more about those few mariners that were sitting on that boat than he did 120,000 folks that were dying and going to hell. Well, they deserve it, Chris. Brother Chris, they deserve it. <coughs> They're wicked. They know what's right. But still, but still, Jonah, if you don't preach to them, who will? Jonah, it'll take me a few more years to raise up somebody else to preach to him. I need a preacher now. I need a preacher now. I come to tell somebody today, why put off the call of God when the anointing is on you now? Why put off the call of God when it's on you now? Go forth, my brother, and preach the gospel. Go forth, sister. Tell somebody about Jesus. In doing so, you may save them that hear you. If the perishing are not enough to wake us up, nothing will. Nothing will. 
Why do you think the image of hell wakes so many churches up today when they can feel the flames? Because they get close to that place in their mind and they don't want to go there. I pray today God would give somebody a vision from hell and show us what it's going to be like if we don't start living from him. The Bible says some are saved by compassion and some by fear. God, put fear in me if that's what it takes to get me saved. Put the fear of God in me. I've got to make it to see heaven one day. Awakened by the perishing. <coughs> I heard this story of a, well, if he's an evangelist or a pastor, but he lived close to the alley in his town. All he had to do was look at that window, Brother Gary, at those coming and stumbling from the bar. All he had to do was look down and, and see those women who were prostituting themselves, to see those young men that were partying and having a big, big time. I, I just heard an article not too long ago in another country that there was about 23 young people that was caught in an underage bar and they don't know what happened. If there was a gas that were, was released or something, but every single one of them perished. God forbid we let our young people down a bar stool. God forbid we let our young people perish because we're too scared to tell them they need to live for God we're not being mean but I just want to grab your hand around the throne of God and dance with you I don't want to see you perish in your iniquity that's all he had to do was look look out that window and a fresh burden came. He was able to hit his knees again with the sounds of music playing because he constantly had something to pray for. But what have we done? We've got into the sides of the ship, Brother Ben. We've gotten away from the world. We've separated ourselves so much that we ain't even around nobody that we can witness to. I didn't come to tell you to be like the world, but I also didn't come to tell you to reject them. We got a job that we need to look at them and say I love you but God loves you more I want you to be in heaven with me one day I want to tell you God's wanting to bring revival to Corinth, Mississippi He's wanting to bring revival to the United States of America Sure, we may go down hell's hole a hundred years from now but I believe as the prophet Joel said I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh Your sons and daughters shall prophesy I just feel liberty today and I know I'm going past my time but he didn't say your men and women shall prophesy. He said your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. It's time some young people start standing up and living for God and when you do I believe the spirit of prophecy can rest upon you. I believe the giftings of the spirit can flow through you. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Then it says your old men shall dream dreams. Come on, elder. Come on, elder. Your days are not past you. Dreams still can still come to you. God can still give you things in the night hour. You're not too old to be used by God. Your days are not over. Let God give you a dream. And it says, and your young men shall see visions. You know what I'm praying is going to happen? That out of this church, there's going to be missionaries that go forth, evangelists that go forth. There's going to be men that come out of this church and say, I got a vision from God. He wants me to go and preach. He wants me to go and tell people about him. It's not going to happen overnight. But if we'll constantly, every day, be awakened by the perishing, when we get sleepy, when we feel like giving up, just think of all the folks dying and going to hell. If that ain't enough to wake you up, nothing will. Let us be awakened. I did some numbers. Did some numbers. I don't know if they're accurate. In the world. There's about 166,000 people that die every single day. 
I believe. Maybe I'm wrong. <coughs> Studies say between, it actually says 2.2 billion, but about 1.2 of them are Catholic. So Catholicism is not Christianity. They've got them in the cup, but they're not in the cup. I'll just go ahead and dispel that today. That's, that's, that's false. And if you're a Catholic today, I'm sorry for that, but you can get right before you leave. So you give about one billion people. There's 7.3 billion people in the world. About one billion of them claim to be Christians. Okay? So that leaves about 6.3 people that are not Christians in the world. And if 166,000 people are dying every day from my calculations, and it may be wrong, there's about 150,000 people that are dying every single day that are not Christians. Jonah had a day's work of that. All he had to do was go and open his mouth. I'm going to tell you, church, we can't, we're not going to be able to save 150,000 one day. But if we can just pull into hell and snatch out one. Oh, he that wins souls is wise. If we can just reach one, Brother Chris. If we can just reach a Paul. If we can just reach a Peter. If we can just reach a Deborah. We just need to reach somebody. Just get your hand in the fire. Start pulling folks out. we got to be awakened by the perishing. I'm done if I don't. If I don't stop, I may keep going. Stand to your feet all across the house, if you will. <coughs> I want us to get a fresh revelation of what our purpose is here on this earth. You know what happened to Jonah? He preached one of the greatest revivals that's ever been preached. 120,000 folks, you know what they did? The king got up, he said, we're proclaiming a fast. Not just me, but our women, our men, our donkeys, everything. You ain't eating nothing. We're going to proclaim a fast. And God looked down and he said, I see their works and I'm going to save them. You know what the Bible says Jonah done? Let me, let me read this verse, what he told God. After he told him the reason he fled to Tarshish, listen to what he said to him again. He said, therefore now, O Lord, I beseech thee my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Coming out of one of the greatest revivals he's ever preached, he said, I'd rather die than see another 120,000 saved. Oh my God. This was a prophet. This was a prophet of God. But he said, it's not worth it. Take my life from me. Telling somebody today, if we got breath in our body, please, let's decide. I'm preaching to this preacher today. Give me a fresh hunger for souls, God. Wake me up from my sleep, oh God, from my slumber, from my comfort. Don't let me be like Jonah, God. So saved, so saved that you're willing others would perish so you could make it. Oh God. Come, come worship team. I know we're late on time right now. But I wonder if somebody that has a hunger and says, God, I want you to call me to help save souls. Come on now. I don't care how young you are, how old you are. But I'm telling you, if you'll get a desire, God will lead you. Come on, mighty, get a desire for more. You don't have to have the greatest voice. He just said cry. Just cry out. It don't have to sound pretty, Chris. It don't have to sound like the, these preachers that preach this conference. But you got the voice of a preacher in you. Just repent. Turn from your ways. It don't have to sound pretty. You don't have to have it laid out in sermon format. But when the Holy Ghost moves on you at Walmart, look at somebody and say, Hey, you ought to come to church with me. I know a God who can fix you. When you're out on the street corner and the Holy Ghost moves on you, all you got to do is pray. Pat them on the back and say, look, I used to be just like you, but God's working on me, and he'll do the same for you. Are you hungry today? Are you hungry to be used by God? Will you let the perishing awaken you out of your sleep? Oh, Jonah, oh, sleeper, arise and do God's will. ha, <laughs> ha.